The Paramount City Council is now called to order. We will have the Pledge of Allegiance led by Youth Commission Board. Um, would they please come forward? Please stand, place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. We will have the invocation led by Reverend Grady Jones from the New Commandment Baptist Church. Them to come for your presence. Thank you for this another day. Thank you, Father God, for blessing we enjoy in America, Father God, for our country, our leaders, and most for this city called Paramount, Father God, for truly you've done some mighty and great things for all of us in this city. Thank you for the leadership, Father God, pray that I continue to guide them, Father, the way that glorify thee and see the growing their leadership. For every citizen in this city, Father God, we, are, we all come together as one city, Father, one nation. We pray for our country, Father, there's too much turmoil in America right now, only you can straighten it out. So that's in Jesus' name, Father God, bring, bring peace to America and to our city. Bless those who less fortunate we are. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Pastor Jones. At this time, we'll have roll call of council members, please. Councilmember Gian? Here. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Here. Councilmember Lemons? <coughs> Vice Mayor Hansen? Here. Mayor Martinez? Here. At this time, we'll have presentations. I'd like my colleagues to please join me at the podium. <sighs> Tonight, we are recognizing special members of the Paramount community. First up, I want to thank the members of our wonderful Youth Commission for being present and leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. At this time, I'd like you to step forward and take a photo with you. Tonight we are proclaiming February as National Children's Dental Health Month in Paramount. This observance, begun by the American Dental Association, brings together professionals, health care providers, and educators to promote the benefits of good oral health to children, their caregivers, teachers, and others. This year's slogan is Brush and Clean Between to Build a Healthy Smile. Locally, we'd like to recognize a nonprofit that does important work in this field and who the city supports with funding. The Children's Dental Health Clinic provides quality dental care and oral health education to children and young adults through the age of 21 who may have issues with access to care. With us tonight to accept the proclamation for National Children's Dental Health Month is Dr. John Blake. Please come forward, Dr. Blake. Thank you. Oh, Dr. Blake, you're so good. 
Last month, we retired one of our Boulevard of Heroes banners. These hang along Paramount Boulevard to honor the brave women and men of Paramount who are currently serving in the military. When an individual earns their tour of duty, we present the benefit, pardon me, the banner itself, along with the smaller version to them and or their families. We also give them a challenge point that signifies their connection to Paramount and how they represent the city while they serve. Tonight, we have one more presentation. Please welcome Specialist Daniel Miranda of the United States Army. We thank this proud soldier for his service to our country and for representing Paramount so well. Paramount Education Partnership is celebrating its 15th anniversary this year. We mark this milestone, the PEP Foundation Board of Directors authorized the funding of some videos that highlight the program's achievements. We'd like to thank the board for its service to our community. Now we'd like to take our seats and watch the videos. Uh, Madam Mayor, as uh, you and the rest of the council are coming up, just to point out a few things. Um, there, as you said, there are three videos that were produced. We're showing two tonight. Uh, the first one targets students to get them to apply for the PEPS scholarship, while the other video is a historical review of the program, its roots, and its successes. So the third video, which targets the business community to try and to get them to donate to the program, we're going to be showing at the State of the City on Thursday, um, and all three videos will be available on the website as well as our YouTube channel. So with that, um, we'll turn it over to Jonathan to start it up. The Paramount community has a long-standing mission to invest in our youth. PEP makes education beyond high school more obtainable through financial support for you, our young people. We invest in you because your success helps our entire community thrive. We believe in our students and we want them to be successful. Keep watching to see the story of two recent scholarship recipients learn how the PEP program has affected their lives and influence on how they view their futures. I am currently attending the California University of Long Beach and I am majoring in psychology. It's my freshman year, my first semester, and I'm studying criminal justice, but I'm also thinking about doing communications. There was at some point where I knew I wasn't going to be able to attend college, but with the help of many organizations and grants, I was able to attend. The way I heard about the PEP scholarship program was I was at the College and Career Center at my high school and I was looking at the local scholarships and PEP just caught my attention. Some of the requirements for it were for me. When I received the news that I was one of the recipients of the scholarship, my reaction was excitement. I was grateful and I couldn't stop smiling the entire day. What I hope to do after graduation is a public speaker, a motivational speaker, or with the criminal justice path, become a transportation securities admissions agent. After graduation, I really want to become a school counselor, to give back to the community, to help out and guidance those students who are in need. What I would say to other students about applying for the scholarship is take the opportunity because college is expensive, but this is a way for you to get support. Don't feel that you're by yourself or alone, that you don't have opportunities. There's always someone willing to help you out. So just take the opportunity and you don't know where you might end up. The City of Paramount supports and believes in you. Apply for a PEP scholarship today and see where your education takes you. Great job, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> In 2002, 
500 parents, business owners, clergy, teachers, school administrators, and city staff came together to answer the question, how can we dramatically increase the levels of education in our community? When we were looking um, for something that could turn education around in the city of Paramount and how to be invested. I was mayor at that time, and Mr. West had a tradition of always going to his mayor and saying, what is it you want to do with your year? What is it you want to accomplish? I think he was a little taken back when I said, education. I don't think it was about two weeks later, he came back to me and said, wow, I just went to the greatest seminar, and I heard this man speak. His name is Richard Hollingsworth. He's from the Gateway Cities Partnership. Richard died, unfortunately, before he saw this program become the huge success that it is, but he was the choreographer of, of PEP, wouldn't you say? I would say that, absolutely. The result of these meetings and discussions was the Paramount Education Partnership. PEP, as it has come to be known, is an alliance between the City of Paramount, the Paramount Unified School District, and the Paramount Chamber of Commerce. We're working with the Gateway Cities Partnership, who then actually put together um, a plan, steps that we would take where we needed to go. And that, again, came from the feedback that we got from the community. Like, from the residents, one of the things that they told us is, we would like learning facilities closer to us. So we figured out, first we opened up a learning center that housed 50 computers and exceptional tutors that all these students could go to these learning centers and get homework help. Then there were the <coughs> students who told us, you know, I would love to go to college, but I have no transportation. Hence the college-bound buses came into play. The school district had a program in place called MESA, but their attendance was super low. So the city's marketing plan went into play. There were all kinds of pieces to the puzzle that had to happen that came from each different segment of the community telling us what they needed. We then needed to go sell the program to the community, to the parents and the kids. We would take kids in MESA and then other kids to Long Beach Community College, to Cal State Long Beach, to other colleges. The staff and faculty would meet us and talk to the kids about what it's like to go to college and the benefits of that. And, and I think that just started breaking down the barriers for everybody to get excited about, I'm going to college. I recall some of the strategies that were important to enhance education here in Paramount were things uh, such as making sure that we communicated to the entire community that this was going to be an available program for students, for families, and for stakeholders to be involved with. The program offers various scholarships to students attending community college, university, and technical institutions. As far as fundraising for these scholarships, everybody was totally on board. The business community, they were willing to donate. The city was willing to help out in any which way. And then the students and the community themselves got involved. We started a Pennies for Pep program to try to raise money. We got to change the name to Pennies for Pep program because now they are raising tens of thousands of dollars for this program. So as you can see, the whole community is working and has evolved to make this program work, and it's working. We've had over 300 children receive PEP scholarships, and we've given out over a million dollars. Every new council member, every new city manager, they all support this program, not only just by putting in sweat equity, but also with the general fund budget. PEP builds a culture of education that instills in every child the idea that their future will include college. The PEP program has been transformational. It's not only been a great model for any number of reasons, but it has changed the lives of individuals as well as families here in the city of Paramount. PEP strives to encourage residents to go as far as possible in their educational goals as an economic engine to stimulate a stronger, safer, and richer community. That vision and dream just kind of exploded and just went way, way over that what we decided to do. Those learning centers are now, all these students there, they're getting help. It's also the home base for these parents. There's these group of mothers that are exceptional that they formed these English as a second language classes, citizen classes, health and exercise classes. With donations primarily from local businesses and other community members, PEP has awarded more than $1 million in scholarships to Paramount students. In the future, I see PEP just continuing the way it's going right now and then just getting more and more Paramount kids into higher education, postgraduate education, high paying jobs, starting their own businesses, coming back and investing in Paramount. So that's what I see. 
And I would love to see our initial goal was a really big one, but maybe one day we'll achieve it, which is that any kid that lives in the city of Paramount or is part of the Paramount Unified School District that wants to go to college um, or to a technical training school, that they have that opportunity. I believe PEP hopes to achieve in the future is something that's bigger than Paramount. The well-being and the education of a large body of individuals, families, and students will no doubt make a difference in our entire state, if not our entire nation. For more information on the Paramount Education Partnership, visit ParamountEducation.org. That's great. Good. Good job. I can't believe it's been 15 years. I know. It seems really, like yesterday. It does. So you young ones apply for those scholarships. <laughs> Education is a gift no one can ever take from you. So pursue your dreams and get that education. Okay. Are there any public comments, Mr. Marino? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. We do have one public comment card. It's from uh, Ms. Andrea Crow from the Paramount Library. Andrea? <clears throat> Good evening, Andrea. Mayor Martinez, council members, and the city of Paramount. This week, Paramount Library has something for everyone. Adults can join our knitting club, Hooked on Yarn, which meets every Thursday at 12 p.m. Also this Thursday at 4 p.m., MakeMo is bringing binary bracelets to Paramount Library. Computers represent all information as a series of zeros and ones called binary code. Teens are invited to make a bracelet with a secret message only they and their computers can read. Every Friday in February from 1015 to 1045, we are offering Smarty Pants Storytime for children ages two to five. Children and their caregivers will enjoy books, songs, and rhymes, and movement while learning school readiness skills. Paramount Library also hosts a family-friendly film every Saturday in February at 11 a.m. This week's film is Ratatouille. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Andrea. <clears throat> Any other comments? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, consent calendar, please. Move it. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. Item one, um, public hearing ordinance number 1111. May I have a staff report, please? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, the next two items are similar. It's something that we do every year. Uh, we adopt the county's revised traffic code and health code into our, our municipal code. Uh, doing this annually allows us and the county to enforce the most recent county codes within our jurisdiction, uh, just in case there have been any changes made over the last year. And with that, I'll turn it over to our public safety director, Adriana Lopez, who will handle items number seven and eight. Adriana. Thank you, John. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. As John mentioned, we bring this before you on an annual basis. The City of Paramount Municipal Code has always adopted and incorporated by reference the Los Angeles County Traffic Code. To ensure that our code is up to date, we annually reincorporate the latest version of the County Code into our Municipal Code. The state does require that we follow a certain procedure, and that requires the County Codes to be referenced. The City Council must set a date for a public hearing and have a first reading of the ordinance. The City Council at its January 8, 2019 meeting approved and set a public hearing date for this evening. It is recommended that the City Council hold a public hearing, read by title only, wait for the reading and introduce no ordinance number 1111 and place it on the next regular agenda for adoption. I'll be happy to answer any questions. At this time, I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak in favor, in opposition? Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. May I have a motion, Make please? Make a motion to move the item. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Yes. Mayor Martinez? <clears throat> yes. Item 8, Public Hearing Ordinance Number 1112, staff report, please. Adriana? Yes, this is a similar um, item, and once again, the City of Paramount Municipal Code has always adopted and incorporated by reference the Los Angeles County Health and Safety Code. And once again, to ensure that our code is up to date, we annually reincorporate the latest version of the county code into our municipal code. 
The state law does require that a certain procedure be followed by adopting the county codes by reference. The city council must set a date for a public hearing and have its first reading of the ordinance. The city council at its January 8, 2019 meeting approved setting a public hearing for this evening. It is recommended that the city council hold a public hearing, read by title only, waive further reading and introduce ordinance 1112 and place it on the next reg regular agenda for adoption. I'll be happy to answer any questions. At this time, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak in favor, in opposition? Make a motion, close public hearing. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? <coughs> yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. Move the item. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. Item 9, Public Hearing Resolution Number 19001. Staff report, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, the next item involves a project that is still just a few years away from breaking ground. It's the Garfield Avenue Widening Project. It's still in design right now. Um, tonight, we're asking for your approval of the environmental document for this project. Uh, the presentation that you're about to hear will give you details of the project and also discuss the environmental document itself that we're asking you to adopt. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll introduce our Assistant City Manager, Kevin Chun, who will handle the item. Kevin? Yes, thank you, John. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. This is a request to adopt uh, the environmental documentation related to the Garfield Avenue Capacity Enhancement Project. Um, in this case, it'll be a mitigated negative declaration. As you may recall, the proposed project will span the entire length of Garfield Avenue through Paramount. This project will help with improving safety and to reduce congestion resulting from employment and population growth, mainly due to Paramount's proximity to the ports. Here are a couple maps showing the project location. And again, the project will run the full length of Garfield Avenue from the city limits on the north to the south. The project will include several improvements, including an additional travel lane in each direction, additional left turn lanes at the Garfield Alondra and Garfield Rosecrans intersections, signal synchronization, utility undergrounding, and improvements for stormwater capture and landscaping. It's anticipated that the project will commence over the next two years. The project will cost $39.5 million and will be funded through local and regional transportation funding programs including Measure R funds for the I-710 corridor project. The project was also identified by Metro as an early action project of the broader multi-billion dollar I-710 project. Oops. <coughs> will Dan Engineering perform the environmental analysis and documentation? Their study efforts were in compliance with CEQA guidelines and a mitigated negative declaration was prepared concluding that there would not be any significant unavoidable impacts to the environment with this project. Of course, unfortunately, as with any major construction project of this scope, there will be substantial traffic and other impacts to residents uh, related to the construction of this project. So with that, um, staff recommends your adoption of resolution number 19001, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak in favor, in opposition? Make motion to close the public hearing. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. Move the item. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. Item 10, may I have the staff report, please? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor Council. Uh, managing stormwater has become a big part of our lives for many years now. Uh, because our stormwater drains into the LA and San Gabriel rivers and then out into the ocean, we, as well as a large group of other cities, we're all responsible for the level of toxins that flow <coughs> into the ocean. Uh, the state has determined what level of toxins are allowed to drain into the two rivers. Uh, to help us with this state requirement, um, us, we and a group of other cities uh, we, we in the region, we've developed a plan, and this plan has been administrated by a third-party group uh, through a joint powers agreement. 
so before you tonight is an approval of a memorandum of understanding that would keep us involved with this JPA. So with that, I'll turn it over to our Public Works Director, Adriana Figueroa, who will handle the item. Adriana. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, back in March of 2012, the California Regional Water Quality Control Board adopted a total maximum daily load, also known as TMDL, for the Dominguez Channel and Los Angeles and Long Beach Harbors for metals and toxic pollutants. This TMDL requires the development and subsequent implementation of a monitoring plan and monitoring activities. And as is the case with many TMDL requirements, Several cities and agencies that are tributary to the LA and Long Beach harbors have worked together with the Los Angeles Gateway Region Integrated Regional Water Management Joint Powers Authority, but Gateway Water Management Authority for short, um, to develop the original Memorandum of Understanding or the MOU, which was finalized back in April of 2014 and allow these agencies to share the cost of the implementation plan and monitoring activities. That agreement is set to expire in 2019, and the agreement before you will continue those efforts through December 31st, 2024. As per the cost share formula, Paramount's annual estimated costs are uh, about $8,400, and the total has been accounted for in the current fiscal year 19 budget. That concludes my presentation, and I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Are there any questions for Ms. Figueroa? Move the item. Second. Roll call, please. Councilmember Guillen? Yes. Councilmember Hoffmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hanson? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. Item 11, oral report, Major W update, staff report, please. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and Council, um, you may recall at the November 2018 election, LA County voters approved a parcel tax measure that increased property taxes uh, to pay for the cost of storm water mitigation. Uh, the funds from that tax measure are apportioned to a variety of sources, including a portion that will go to the cities. With us tonight uh, to give us an update on the newly approved measure is a guest speaker from the LA County Public Works Department, and that speaker is Mr. Kevin, uh, excuse me, Keith Liley, who is the Assistant Deputy Director of LA County Public Works. Mr. Liley. Hi, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor. Council members, Good uh, thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on the Safe Clean Water Program, or Measure W, which uh, City Manager just expressed was passed back in uh, November. Uh, we're very happy that it that it did pass, and we appreciate all the support that we got from numerous entities and agencies uh, throughout the county. Uh, the big challenge now is how are we going to implement this program? There's a very broad implementation. Uh, guidelines, but there's a number of steps that we need to take, so I want to give you a, a quick overview of how we're going to uh, get through that process. <clears throat> so one, one of the important parts of this measure, really what, what brought it about, was the need to address a number of regional uh, water resiliency challenges. and how, One of those really is, is climate change and how that affects our local water supply. Climatologists tell us that we're going to have increased periods of drought, more intense storm events, and that really hinders our ability to capture that storm water for local supply. It also affects our ability to, to uh, bring in the imported water and our ability to rely on its availability. We bring in about two-thirds of our water from outside the county. Uh, also of significant importance is the pollution, water quality issues, and the mandate that uh, all the municipalities comply with the MS4 permit. Uh, this is complicated by the fact that there hasn't been a dedicated funding source to address these needs, and hence with the measure W passing the Safe Clean Water Program being established, we'll have a, a method to, to, to address a lot of those challenges. Um, three main focuses of, of the program are to improve local water supply, increase local water quality, and enhance communities in doing so when we implement those projects that, that address those. Primarily, we're going to capture stormwater runoff, clean it, and then reuse that water either as you know, local water supply or um, local reuse for, for facilities. And in building those projects, it may be we have a stormwater capture project that also um, puts it in cisterns, puts it in the ground. But on top of that, you'll be able to put a park or you can capture it along streets and greenways. There's a number of, of uh, measures to implement that. 
Um, and these will be carried out across the region. It's a regional solution, a regional approach. And because of that, uh, voters were, were you know, compelled to, to pass it. I think it was 69%. Uh, we only needed 66 in a, a sort of 66.6 .6 to pass it. So. Uh, program, there's really three programs. There's a regional program, a municipal program, and a flood control district program. We estimate there'll, there'll be about 300 million in revenue generated annually from that parcel tax. That tax comes from <coughs> two and a half cents per square foot of impermeable area on each parcel. Um, that 50 percent, that 150 million, would do regional programs in each of the nine watershed regions, and then the 40 percent of that fee will go back to each of the municipalities. So, if uh, uh, residents of Paramount paid that tax. They paid $100. $40 of that, that will go back to Paramount. $50 will go to regional programs. And then $10 will go to the uh, flood control district for managing the program and implementing uh, programs across the flood, flood control district. Uh, this is a uh, further illustrate that point. The, the city is in the lower San Gabriel River watershed. Um, that 50% uh, funding. Uh, for the watershed area would be about 17.4 million for this watershed regional project, and that 40% that would come directly to, to the city would be about uh, 690,000 annually. So there's about 15 other cities in, in your uh, region that are a part of the uh, region managing regional projects from, well maybe the next slide will help illustrate a little better. You may have to zoom in on your, your individual <laughs> screens to see that. Uh, there's, there's nine regions. Each of the, each of the regions have 17 uh, committee members. And so there are seven members that are basically uh, the municipalities. And we went through a self-selection process where the cities were, were invited to participate. And they assigned uh, representatives to each uh, each region has seven cities. Uh, you're happy to know that you did uh, receive a, a, a representative. You were voted to, to represent your region, so you have one of the seven seats. Uh, the other 10 seats are board appointed by our county board of supervisors. They include a, um, the LA County Flood Control District has one seat. And then uh, others will be assigned to a water agency, a groundwater agency, a, a sanitation agency and a municipal parks or open space agency. And then there'll also be five representatives from uh, representing business, environmental justice, the environment, <coughs> and two at-large seats. So all of those 10 seats for the nine regions will, will be uh, appointed by the Board of Supervisors. And maybe less complicated than the last slide, but still, still uh, very complicated. Uh, this is from our program elements that was in the, or the measure that was passed to try and illustrate kind of the, the governance to a certain extent. That, that blue bar in the center represents each of those uh, nine watersheds. And their, their goal really is to develop a stormwater investment plan. How are they going to use that 50% of that money that comes into these regions? Um, though each of those uh, investment plans will be subject to a regional oversight committee. They'll look at that essentially to make sure that these, this plan that's, that's put forward matches what's the intent of the program, and then those go to the board and, and, and they're all approved. Those investment plans identify uh, really the main thing, which is our infrastructure program. What, what are we going to build with this money? What are, what are we going to do? 85% of that money, at a minimum, has to go towards this uh, infrastructure program and actually building projects. Uh, you'll see that, does this have a... Go um, on the right side, that orange box, you'll see that that represents the infrastructure program. Below that is the, uh, sorry, I can't even read, the, the basically the, the scientific studies program. That can be up to 5% of the budget for each uh, region. And then there's a uh, uh, technical resource program that uh, is represented in the top left. There's a blue dotted line. That's uh, resources available for helping doing feasibility studies, identifying 
projects. There's also each region will have a watershed coordinator. That's a staff to that region. They will help kind of be their liaison to the community, to some of the other organizations to help identify projects and then work with the technical team to, to come up with them. And then there's the, the actual effort to develop those programs. And there'll be a separate steering committee that will assign scores based on how well they meet the obligations or the intent of the, the measure. Uh, and with those, the, the committee then will develop, or each, each committee will develop their list of recommended programs or projects to go into that storm <coughs> assessment plan. So our timeline for imp implementation is very aggressive. Uh, our goal is that we, we, we've got everything in place when the money becomes available in 2020. So, you know, this is it November 10th, I believe, everyone gets their, their tax bill. Um, you'll start seeing that program as those taxes are collected. We will take those and distribute them between the different programs and make that money available as soon as possible to the, the, the different uh, committees, sorry, the different program elements, the municipal program, the regional program, and through our district. Uh, some of the key timelines are the draft funding agreements. So our agreements with each of the, mis excuse me, each of the <coughs> municipalities on how we'll um, get that money to you, the checks and balances, any auditing, all those different uh, responsibilities will be identified in those um, agreements. Those will be given to you for review prior. Uh, with the intent that they're executed towards uh, the end of the year so they're in place for 2020 so that we can distribute that, that money when it's available. On the regional program, uh, we're right in the process of forming the Watershed Area Steering Committees. Um, and even before we finalize all our ordinance, uh, the implementation ordinance, we'll be asking those committees to actually start looking at projects, start doing feasibility studies, start identifying them. We'll have our Scoring committees formed. We'll actually start doing our scoring. These will be preliminary scoring because they're we're actually in advance of finalizing the implementation ordinance. But we need to to be able to have projects ready to go next fiscal year. We really need or next <coughs> calendar year when the money's available. We really need to start start on that now. Uh, and then on the district side, we're actually uh, writing uh, requests for proposals now for the education program element and for um, establishing the watershed coordinators, and these would be a way to, to get a, a pool of uh, eligible candidates so that as the uh, Washington Area Steering Committees are formed, they can then, uh, within their purview, select those um, watershed coordinators that will, will assist them in their work. And then again, in August is our time frame. We're going back to our Board of Supervisors with the uh, program ordinance, the implementation ordinance itself. I had other than questions. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have one actually. And I don't recall reading it uh, in that bill, but how is 2.5 cents per square foot of impermeable blank, basically, right? How is that going to be determined? Well, there's a, a mapping product that's already available that, that has all this information. So we have it on a, you know, each of the 2.2 million parcels in LA County, we have identified what that, what that number is. In fact, if you go to the uh, Safe Clean Water Program website now, if you have your individual parcel, you can plug in your information and see what that, that number is. There will be a appeal process in case we've got it wrong, that they can uh, demonstrate that the, in fact, the information is correct or that they've torn out their you know, decking and they've put in landscaping or what have you. So there is a process that, again, that's part of the implementation ordinance. We'll have those. Uh, so this was protocols. going back to old records possibly? and in, or <laughs> That's what I'm I, getting I, at. I, the I don't grass have area, the, I mean, that's permeable soil there, right? Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's a, the, the, the tool is upgraded, you know, in, Every time there's a new uh, document, it's in, input into the system. They kind of track permit it. of some sort to build a patio or whatever. That okay. Thank you. Thank you. Item thirteen. Pardon me. Item twelve. Um, an oral report, uniform crime report, year end review. 
May I have uh, a staff report, please? Yes, you may, Madam Mayor. Uh, public safety has always been a priority for the City Council, as you know. So at this time each year, we like to take a moment to review the crime statistics from the previous year and compare, I'm sorry, the past year, in this case 2018, <coughs> and compare those to the previous year, in that case would be 2017. Uh, we've been very fortunate enough to see some real improvements in our crime statistics over the years, as you know. Uh, a lot of this is a tribute to the partnership that the city has with law enforcement partners, that is the LA County Sheriff's Department. And also go, goes back to decades of hard work that past city councils, current city council, community members, staff have done to get us to this point that you're about to see. So uh, with us tonight is another guest speaker and it's our acting captain from the Lakewood Regional Station, that's Lieutenant David Springle. So Lieutenant, take it away. Good evening and thank you Mayor Martinez, fellow council members for allowing me to address you tonight. Tonight I will be discussing part one crimes which will include crimes against property to include burglary, grand theft auto, <laughs> larceny and arson, as well as crimes against person which will include murder, sexual assault, robbery and aggravated assault. On behalf of Sheriff Alex Villanueva, Captain Richard Harpham, the men and women serving the city of Paramount, I would like to thank you, Mayor Martinez, fellow council members, City Manager John Moreno, Public Safety Director Adriana Lopez, for your leadership, supportive relationship, and provi providing our personnel with the resources for success. In the 2018 calendar year, Part 1 crime saw an overall decrease of 9%. There was a slight increase in crimes against persons with increases seen in sexual assault and robbery. Of the 19 reported sexual assault incidents in 2018, six were found to have occurred in years prior to 2018. Of those other incidents, 13 incidents, there were no repeat offenders identified and the majority of the suspects were known to their victims. Of the robberies, the service area team adjusted their schedules and organized overtime to target when they identified patterns or areas that were concerning to them. On a positive note, there were drops in both murder and aggravated assault, which was a very positive result. There were significant drops in burglary of 25%, grand theft auto of 22%. I believe this can be attributed to better awareness and communication between our personnel, the City Safety Department, and the community. A 10-year history of Part 1 crime showed an overall decrease of 14%. <coughs> Gang-related crime showed a reduction over 10 years of 94%. This includes 93% decrease in violent crime and 100% overall decrease in property crime. The year of 2018 saw a 63% decrease from the year 2017, including a 60% decrease in violent crime and 100% decrease in property crime. Gang related, grain, excuse me, Gang-related crime reported totals were 145 incidents back in 2009 compared to just eight in 2018, which shows a total decrease of 94%. Calls for service. Calls for service saw a significant drop in routine calls with small changes in emergent and priority calls for service. Total calls for 2018 was 19, more than 19,000 compared to more than 20,000 calls in 2017. So we saw a total reduction in calls of 1,000. Res response times. Response times saw no change in our response to emergency or priority calls, with a slight reduction in time response to routine calls for service. As you can see on the chart, our response times were well below the countywide average. Crime reduction highlights. We continue to see a homeless reduction number, a decrease in commercial burglaries, which are attributed to proactive work with our businesses providing crime prevention and suggestion, 
decrease in graffiti, which has a serious and direct positive impact on quality of life issues within the city, increased school safety, which I attribute to the positive impact by our school resource deputies, as well as proactive interaction with the school district. Increased traffic enforcement, which included 1,400 dedicated hours of enforcement and over 3,700 citations issued during 2018. There was an increase in neighborhood watch. With that increase, I believe it's community-based community policing at its best with a positive ownership of the community um, or taking positive ownership of the community by both the deputies and the citizens. Notable arrests from 2018, there was the Pizza Hut robbery that was on 1231 of 2018 on New Year's, New Year's Eve. Deputy Simpkins arrested an armed suspect he observed fleeing from the, uh, uh, the Pizza Hut that he had just robbed. He arrested the suspect and the subsequent investigation led to a conviction of the suspect where he was sentenced to 15 years in state prison. Another highlighted arrest was February 16, 2018, another robbery which involved deputies arresting four gang members for a robbery at the Julio's T-shirts. This investigation led to the conviction of each of the suspects for sentences of two to four years each in prison. There was additionally uh, suspects with information that were uh, detained outside the city that were identified through proper investigations by our detective bureau that tied them to additional robberies in the city towards the end of the year which was a very positive impact as well. Our goals for 2019 are to provide a safer <coughs> community through positive relationship building with the citizens and businesses who call Paramount home. Our success is a result of the dedication, support, and resources provided to the department through the city manager, John Moreno, public safety director, Adriana Lopez, Mayor Martinez and the City Council. We thank you, and is there any questions that I may be able to answer? There aren't any questions, but um, I would like to commend Lieutenant Barragon and our Public Safety Director, Adriana Lopez, and our deputies. I see them out in the streets always, and they're dedicated. And if you would be so kind to um, share this information with Sheriff Ian Reva, that we are very proud of our deputies and our public safety here in Paramount. I absolutely will. I'm very thankful that you guys have Oscar uh, guiding the yeah. ship, and I know he does a great job. So thank yes. you very much, and thank you for allowing me to speak to you. Tonight. Thank you, Lieutenant Sprinkles. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item <laughs> item 13, 2019 Summer Concerts and Haytree hey Special Events Concerts. Staff report, please. Hey, yes, Madam Mayor and Council, although we're still months and months away from summer, <laughs> we wanted to give you a preview of this summer's lineup for our summer concert series. Uh, believe it or not, this will be our fifth year that we've held the Summer Concert Series, and uh, we also want to highlight a new art and music event that we'd like to start off this year. So with that, I'll turn it over to our <coughs> Community Services and Recreation Director, David Johnson, to have the item. Dave. Thank you, John, Mayor um, Martinez, and Council members. Uh, so while we're physically not in summer, the Recreation Department is mentally in summer. <laughs> um, we're planning ahead, so we'll go over the concerts that we have planned. Uh, so just to re reiterate, uh, the concerts now are held at Progress Park. They've been there for the last two years. Uh, it's a 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. event. Uh, we do actually start the main concert at 6.30, but it gives us a half hour if we have some local groups that might want to perform in that half hour block. Uh, it, this year it will run from July 11th to August 15th, again on Thursdays. Uh, we did pick a, a variety of music, so hopefully we got a little bit of something for everybody. And this is a really a wonderful event that we hold each year that brings our community together. So this is our band roster for the summer. There's six groups, we have six events. And what we'll be doing is going through each one of these and showing you a little snippet. So our first one on July 11th is a Motown group and it's the Blue Breeze Band. If we could play the clip. So that's what that one will look like now. Uh, this one actually was suggested by our youth commission. They wanted a 90s band. They didn't know that that was a popular thing with our young folks. Uh, so if all of you have some uh, very colorful neon clothes left in your closet, here's the chance to bring them out. Uh, so we'll be doing a, a 90s cover band. So if we can see that clip. Come on, 
I know you're all going to come out for that. <laughs> <laughs> and then July 25th, we have Spanish Rock with Nubis. Now, Nubis is actually an interesting group. Three of the band members graduated Paramount High School. One of the band members still lives in Paramount. So this one, uh, some of our staff actually went to a local concert where Nubis was there, and they saw all their friends from Paramount and Paramount High School. So this one will be a really fun concert for us. We can play that clip. You can see that was at the Santa Fe uh, Springs uh, Swamp Meet. And then for, um, for our classic rock uh, aficionados, we have Escape, which is a cover band for Journey. You can go ahead and play that clip. So everybody who's got big hair can come out and do that. I can't do that. Um, and then last year, we had this group last year. They were very good. It's a country band, uh, the Smith Band. So let's play that clip. Okay, and then the last group uh, of the six concert series is Los Pingos. Uh, they cover a variety of Latin style of music, and this group's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're actually going to do a little something different with them. Instead of having them up on the big stage, we're going to bring them down to a lower stage and try to create a little more intimate atmosphere, because I think on this one there's going to be a lot of dancing. So we can play that clip. Starts off a little low there. No, Everyone, toe was tamping on that one. Um, and then we'll have our normal food and drinks. We'll have the food truck that comes out, Tacos El Puma. And then here's your chance to hear me speak Spanish. Uh, so actually, there's a local business, La Espiga. Uh, they came out last year. We're going to get them to come out again. So they serve esquite, elotes, and agua frescas. How do I do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and then we do have a local uh, person that does Hawaiian shave ice, so she'll be out as well. And then the last concert where we're going to create that more intimate, intimate, intimate atmosphere, uh, we're going to try a beer garden uh, and see how that works at our uh, concerts. So that's just for the last concert. And then uh, <clears throat> for our concert series, what we started last year is actually uh, approaching our business community to help sponsor these concerts. And this was the, the, the major sponsors last year that contributed to our concerts. Uh, we'll be doing that again. Uh, so we'll have a flyer like this that goes out to the local businesses to see who might want to sponsor. There's various sponsorship levels that you can participate in, uh, but the ones that you saw on the banner that get the most recognition are the, the large sponsors. And then our, our Hay Tree event. Um, so we do want to bring, again, attention to our downtown. Uh, I don't think a lot of folks really know that we have a state historic landmark in town, mm -hmm. our Haytree. So we do want to bring more attention to that and in, into our downtown. Uh, so we're going to propose an evening under the Haytree, a celebration of music and the arts. Uh, so again, it's an emphasis on our Haytree. Uh, we're looking for September 5th. It will be an evening event. Uh, again, a, this is a really interesting environment to hold a concert. It's very intimate as well. Uh, we'd like to bring out our local artists, so we'll have a section that people can see what our local artists are producing. Um, also have a beer and wine area for our folks to enjoy. And then we're trying to, again, make this kind of a very much of a cultural event, you know, a musical uh, act uh, of various different types of music, and then and have our local artists. So here, this first year, we're going to try to emphasize a Spanish version of music and with a flamenco dancer. <clears throat> In subsequent years, we might Maybe we'll do Irish music and Irish dancers. So we're looking at, again, trying to make this a very cultural event. Uh, so we do have a Spanish guitarist and percussionist and a flamenco dancer. And so if you can see that clip. Everyone bring out your castanets. <laughs> Oops, there it goes again. Uh, and then social media. Obviously, we'll be emphasizing and using our social media and written uh, communication to our community through around town uh, to let folks know that we have these concert series and get them to come on out. And that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions. 
I can't believe you finally got a Motown band. <laughs> well, <laughs> someone emphasized that I should, so. Yeah. Very Thank nice, you. David. A variety, and I'm glad that you took input from the community because none of these bands are repeat from last summer, correct? Just the Smith, the country, yes. And, I'm, and we need to um, educate the community more on our hate tree. So I'm glad that we're going to have a concert there as well. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, are there any comments from council members? I have a couple. Okay. Council Member Gillen. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. Um, this Saturday coming up, the Paramount Community Coalition will host their Clearwater Garden Open House. And that's on Jefferson, just... Um, west of Illinois and there's going to be a gardener talking about sustainability and there'll be a lot of giveaways and a lot of raffles and information on how to plant your own gardens. Um, so that starts at 10 a.m. and it'll go for a couple hours. And then another um, issue that came up during the last two weeks, um, some residents notified me that they received uh, Prop 65 notifications. And these were letters that went out by OEHA, and that is a state entity. Uh, but basically what it says is that Aerocraft, Press Forge, and Carlton Forge had to put out these notifications of the chemical that they are, had to notify about was chromium-6. And I just wanted to mention that even though um, we know chromium-6 has been in the air and you don't have cancer, Thank goodness. I just want you to know that if you have, um, and this is what the letter informed, if you have issues with the bloody nose, <clears throat> allergies, asthma, and you live near one of these facilities, it's something to be concerned about. So I did receive a lot of calls and I wanted to mention that. And um, I think that was it. That's it for me. Thank you. Any other council Mayor members? Mayor yeah, if I could just, um, because of council member again raising that, um, I was really concerned when I saw the letter. So um, I talked to John um, just for some clarification. And I don't know if you want to, um, if you can actually, just for edification, um, that the Proc 65 actually goes across the board, not just with manufacturing, but anywhere that there's hazardous chemicals that can cause cancer, even in restaurants, I was told. Yeah, um, Prop 65 warnings are, are, are definitely um, common, if you will, um, from a lot of places. It could be industry, it could be products, too, that are created that have to have the Prop 65 warning. And when we heard about the, the letter, we were concerned as well, and so we did our, our research on this, and talk to uh, uh, people in the know about this stuff, and this is what we were told, so through our research. Um, Starbucks, I believe, for example, um, has a Prop 65 warning, if, if that's what you were referring to. So um, definitely there are um, a lot of Prop 65 warnings out there um, that warn people about uh, possible sources of cancer-causing agents. So. Yes, yeah, so I think it's appropriate that, um, you know, being um, that they have hexachrome, that they have them too, but I just wanted in context that it's across the board with the food we eat, the clothes we wear, everything like that. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And, and follow up to that, it's true, Prop 65 warnings, it's mandated that if you're releasing any type of chemical that could be cancer causing, you are supposed to have this Prop 65 warning on, the, on your building or in the general facility on your fencing. Right. The reason why this is an issue is because these companies did not have that Prop 65 warning that they're mandated to do, so they were sued, and part of that settlement is they now have to have the warnings and the letters had to go out. Yeah, so that's I just wanted absolutely to make that correct. I agree with that. Like I said, just want to put it in context. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council members? Uh, staff reports? Any uh, no staff ma members? Okay, at this time I adjourn this meeting until February 19th at 5 p.m. At this time we'll go into... The successor agency, may I have a um, roll call of council members, please? Council Member Guillen? Here. Council Member Hoffmeyer? Yes. Council Member Lemon? Yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Here. Mayor Martinez? Here. Uh, approval of consent calendar, please. Move it. Second. Roll call, please. <coughs> council Member Guillen? Yes. Council Member Hoffmeyer? Yes. Council Member Lemons? Yes. Vice Mayor Hansen? Yes. Mayor Martinez? Yes. At this time, I adjourn this meeting until March 5th, 2019 at 6 p.m.